got Shabbat Shalom. <laughs> um, I bring greetings from Zambia. I just want to say thank you for the warm welcome. Thank you, Rabbi, for inviting me back. It's been about 10 years uh, since I was last here. And uh, can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> it's been about 10 years, and uh, it's so good to be back. Yeah, it was a different building, of course, but uh, I just thank the Lord for you guys and uh, for what you stand for in the movement. Um, this is also my last stop before I head back to Zambia, and uh, it's such a great honor to be here. I always get two questions wherever I go in your great country. The first one is, where is Zambia? <laughs> it's one of those Z countries. Uh, it's in South Central Africa. And uh, the second question is, are there any Jews in Zambia? And uh, my answer is, when the Lord said, I'll scatter you, when he told our people, he actually did a great job at that. <laughs> yeah, we do have Jews in Zambia. I'll share a little bit about that. And I do have a short video that I'd like to share with you so that you can see what the Lord is doing. And then I'll pick it up from there. In Africa, we have uh, both uh, white and black Jews. Most of the Jewish people in Africa came from Eastern Europe, and uh, you find most of them in South Africa. We also have the black Jews, like the Falasha Jews. Most of them have gone back to Israel. And we have the Lemba Jews, where I come from. They're about 50,000 strong, mostly in Zimbabwe, Mozambique, 
and a bit in Zambia. They've always claimed to be Jewish. No one was able to prove that until a Jewish professor who's not a believer came down and did a DNA test on them and found them to be Kohanim. Yes, so we do have, uh, yes, yes. <laughs> And as a Messianic Jewish congregation, we are reaching out to the lost house of Israel. And uh, we have eight congregations. We used to be 16 congregations. We've lost some of them in tribal lands. We had a lot of persecution. Yeah, we were driven out by people with machetes and spears. So we lost some of the congregations there. But uh, we are still there. We are going strong and we know the God we believe in that is going to bring it to pass. All Israel shall be saved. And we're excited about what the Lord is doing. Uh, we're also reaching out to the traditional Jewish community in Zambia. Most of them came from Eastern Europe. And uh, last year we had a bat mitzvah and almost half the, the, the uh, traditional Jewish community came to a bat mitzvah. And uh, we were able to witness to them uh, about who Yeshua is. And um, we're just excited and would ask you to be praying for our people in Africa as well and throughout the world. We know Yeshua is not coming back until our people uh, call out to him. And uh, we are also seeing a great move in Africa. Uh, I don't know if you knew this, but uh, a lot of African countries are now reaching out to Israel. The Prime Minister of Israel has been to Africa twice this year and about 25 African countries are reaching out to Israel. And we're excited about that too. <laughs> yeah, there's also something that seems not to be reported in the news. In Africa, there are tribes. So we have like 2,000 tribes. Some tribes are huge, like 23 million people, like the Hausa tribe in Nigeria. And then you have other small tribes. So each tribe has a king and a queen. So we have seen a lot of these kings and queens going to Israel to go and seek the God of Israel. And uh, a few years ago, we had a group of about 20 kings and queens from my country. They went to Israel with my wife, Faye, and one of them was a queen of the Goa tribe, uh, which is uh, more than uh, 50,000 people. And when she came back to Zambia, she decided to become a follower of the God of Israel. She made a royal decree in a tribe, and they did away with all the tribal gods, and they began to worship the God of Israel. Wow. Yes. <laughs> so when you look at Africa, there are more than 320 African gods there. But what is amazing is to just see what these people who are embracing the God of Israel are saying. They're saying the God of Israel is real. He's alive. His words are exalted. He's a merciful and loving God. He is a God who cherishes life. His words add value to life. A God who brings hope to the hopeless. And they are coming. Our God may be quiet, but he's not still. He's doing great things. If only we can ask him to open our spiritual eyes, we'll be able to see that our God is being so busy. One thing also that is taking place in Africa, every day 16,000 Muslims are coming to faith in Messiah Yeshua. Yes. What is amazing about all this is that many of these, they've never seen a Bible. They've never seen or met a Bible believer, a Jew or a Christian. But Yeshua is appearing to them in dreams, in visions. And they're coming to faith. There's one guy uh, who was a top uh, Islamic leader. Uh, Yeshua appeared to him and told him, I'm the light of the world. Follow me. This guy has since led 400 imams. An imam is like a pastor or a priest of a mosque. 400 imams. I've come to faith through this man. <laughs> I remember one time I was privileged also to, to bring in uh, some Muslims to our faith. Uh, we had a drought in Zambia and it was so bad 
And uh, we had a church in the United States that asked us to give food. As we were giving food, some people, some Muslims kind of got interested. And their imam approached me and said, why are you giving food to us, to our people, and you're not asking them to become like you? So I told him about our God, that our God tells us to give and not expect anything. And he was like, who is your God? So this kind of opened up a conversation between their God and our God. So I kind of shared with him, our God sent his son to die for you and me. Their God demands that your son dies for him. We shared about our God being a loving God, a merciful God. He knows we are messed up. He says, come as you are. Their God, you're not sure. So later on, this guy said, you know what? You need to come to my place in Eastern Zambia. You need to talk to my people. And this guy had five different mosques under him. So I was not really sure I wanted to go. But my wife, Faye, was like, you have to go. I said, well, I went to Eastern Zambia, and I was taken to these different mosques. And later on, I told him, you know what? I'm not comfortable sharing. I don't know how you guys conduct yourself inside the mosque, but I'd like to share from outside. So we had like 500 Muslims show up. And I was like, what do I tell these people? Basically, I just shared about our God. He's a God who declares the end from the beginning, and you can see him at work. He's a God who changes your life once you give your life to him. I shared and afterward I said, if you want to receive him, please, he's waiting for you. About a hundred Muslims stepped forward. And they said, we want to be mikvah right away, to be baptized right away. In Africa, you don't go to a stream, especially when it's getting dark. We have a lot of crocodiles there. I think you guys have alligators here. So I was like, listen, guys, why don't we do it in the morning? They were like, no, 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 we have to do it right now. So went to the stream, and they were throwing rocks in the, in the stream, and I was like, what are you guys doing? We are trying to chase away the crocs. One by one, they received the Messiah of Israel. <laughs> Our God is alive. Amen. Our God is real. Sometimes it's important, like Gideon, to go into the camp of the enemy and find out more about who we are and who we serve. He's appearing to these people. He's speaking to these people. That changes how we look at ourselves. We have what the world is dying for. And the Lord has prophesied, in the end times, 10 men from the nations shall come and take hold of the tzitzit, of him who is Jewish. There are over 16,000 nations out there. 7.2 billion people. Are we ready for them? Can we tell them about Yeshua? Can they find him in our hearts? I believe it's time to ask him to just invade every area of our lives, to increase as we decrease. To be the light that he called each one of us to be. We spend a lot of time looking at the negative things, what the enemy is doing, and we forget what our God is doing. He's a God who tells us, be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Every day in Africa, 10, every day in Africa, 100,000 people are coming to faith. And we, we all know all roads lead to Jerusalem. Are we ready for that? Are we ready for our people? Rabbi asked me to share a little bit about my testimony. And I pray that it will encourage you and just maybe change how you look at yourself. The Lord called you. Scripture is very clear. You did not choose me, but I chose you. He's got a plan for you and me. It's high time we began to look at ourselves through his eyes. Who are we? What are we doing here? We are here for him. It's his work. The Lord has given us a great privilege to partner with him. He could have done it. 
He spoke the word and the world came into being, the universe came into being. But when it comes to the salvation of souls, of our people, he wants you and me to be involved. Yes, we are up against a lot of stuff. But we know that with him, we are in the majority. I believe this is a time to stand strong and tall and move on for our God. The Lord has planted you for such a time as this to be a light in this part of the world. The Lord wants to reach his Jewish people. And he has called you and me to reach them. The Lord wants to reach the nations. I've traveled in your country for I've visited your country for many, many times. And sadly, many people in the United States think the world has already been evangelized. 3.9 billion people have never heard about Yeshua. We talk more about the second coming when many people have not heard about the first coming. If you look at our Jewish people, 17 million, they are only about 350 thousand messianic Jews we still have work to, to be done and the Lord is counting on you and me every time we obey him we introduce light into this world we need to continue praying for the salvation of our people allow me to give some background as I share a little bit about my testimony uh, Zambia is one of the only two countries in the world that took in Jewish people during and before the Holocaust. The other one being China. So a lot of Jewish people came to Zambia. The entire infrastructure in my country was actually built by Jewish people. The largest university, the largest hospital, Amen. the international airport, and our economy was doing very well. Sadly, in 1973, after the Yom Kippur Wars, there was a push by the Arab countries on the rest of the African countries to break off ties with Israel. And Zambia sadly broke off ties with Israel, took over Jewish businesses, and six months later, the economy collapsed. Talking of over 80% unemployment. Over two million orphans you're talking of five-year-olds taking care of two-year-olds. A lot of poverty, and that just reminds you what the Bible says. I bless those who bless my people and curse those who curse my people. This is why we're so excited that your country, your president, decided to recognize Jerusalem. <laughs> The world may make noise, but the God of Israel is bigger than the world. Amen. He's going to bless your country. But Zambia broke off ties, and everything collapsed. I grew up during that time. My, both my parents were physicians. So they lost their jobs. I grew up in the capital city, Lusaka. We ended up living 30 miles outside the city. I began to ask myself many questions. I experienced what many people in Africa were experiencing. Poverty, hunger. At that time I lived with my parents. My dad was only making like $12 a month. He was a physician. That was his pension. I lost most of my family members because we could not pay for their medication. They won't treat you unless you pay first. Lost my mother because we couldn't raise $65. So they wouldn't give her medication. I was looking for something to get to hold on to. By the way, Africa has over 300 different gods. So I was coming from a family that was not religious, but they were kind of involved with this the African uh, tribal worship system. I was involved with that too, in trying to just find hope, something I can get a hold of. 
until somebody said, why don't you try reading a Bible? I didn't have a Bible. I couldn't, I couldn't afford a Bible. So I began to walk 30 miles to the nearest library to read. I could only walk one way from my village you know, to Lusaka and uh, spend a day or two. As I read, something just started jumping out of the, the Bible. There was a God who was so different from a, the gods I grew up knowing. A God who claimed that he owned the universe. A God whose values were so different from what I used to know. And I was like, wow, who is this God? So I spent time studying about him. And Israel kept on coming. Israel is my people. Israel is my firstborn. So I ended up believing in this great God. I went to my village. I was so excited. For the first time in my life, I had hope. I went back to my family. I was like, you won't believe what I found. I found the true God. After telling them about who, you know, the great God of Israel, they kicked me out. I was like, I don't understand. Time came when we're supposed to go and do worship, uh, to pray to the spirits. I said, you know what, from what I'm reading, I can't do that anymore. So I was kicked out of my village too. I was confused. So I joined myself to the Jewish community in, in my country, who took me in and uh, started the process of conversion, but they told me, no believing in Jesus here. I was like, who is Jesus? Secretly, I started studying about him. From what I was reading in my Bible, he was the Messiah. I said, he's the Messiah. Well, I got kicked out too. <laughs> Joined myself to a church. It's a great church. But they believed that they were the new Jews that replaced Israel. Amen. I remember this one time going to the pastor. I was like, you have to help me out here. Jeremiah says, as long as the sun, the moon, the stars are still there, Israel is they're still God's people. They kicked me out too. I said, you, you're not even a pastor. You're not even, what can you tell us? So I went back. I was confused. I was like, wow. So I tried to prove myself wrong by reading the word of God again and again. But the more I read, the more the truth stood out. But as I read the word, I discovered that the Lord had a people, Jew and Gentile. And he wanted me to be engrafted into this tree. The tree of Israel. At, that, at this time, I didn't even own my own Bible. So I kept on going back and forth. By the way, it took me about seven years. And I read in Romans 11 verse 17 about the tree of Israel here. I'll read it real quick. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them and became a partake of the root of the olive tree with its richness. From this I understood that the Lord expected me and those from the nations to be grafted in into this tree. I wanted to be among his people. But I was confused because I, went, I was part of the traditional Jewish community that didn't believe in Yeshua. As I read the Bible in Revelation 14 verse 12, the Bible reads, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the Torah of Adonai and the faith of Yeshua. I started looking for them. Lord, where are these people who keep Shabbat? Who's, who keep the Jewish faith? but still believe in Yeshua. Sometimes I went on the street asking people, do you know any Jews who believe in Jesus? And they'll look at me it's like, are you okay? 
I read different books, and most of the books said they existed until the fourth century. Since that time, they don't exist. But I would go back to the Bible. Romans 11 verse 5 would tell me again and again, even so then at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. It's like they are there, but where are they, Lord? So if there's an engrafting, there must be a tree I was supposed to be engrafted to. So I began to look. At the same time, I was also looking for those from the nations because I believed that the Lord was blessing the nations or the Lord related to the nations on how they related to Israel. And by the way, the nations will be judged in line with how they treat Israel and the Jewish people. Matthew 25, beginning from 31. Allow me to read this real quick. Now when the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then you sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and you separate them from one another, just as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And you put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat, I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I was, I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and fed you? Or thirsty and, and give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invite you in? Or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And answering, the king who said to them, Amen, I tell you, whatever you did to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. And understood this, as Hebrews 2 verse 17 says, I understood the brothers of Yeshua to be the people of Israel. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in all things, so he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in matters relating to God. So there I was. I was looking for Jewish believers. I was also looking for Gentiles who loved Israel, who prayed for Jerusalem. And I wanted to be part of God's people. Knowing, as John 15 says, John 15 verse 4, a branch on its own cannot bear fruit. I wanted to be engrafted. I remember this one day, seven years had passed. By then, my family had disowned me. I was homeless for five years. Went through a lot of persecution for my faith. When I started, I thought it was going to take just a, a month or two. You know, the, the scripture in uh, Matthew 6, 33, seek ye first the kingdom. I thought, well, I'll seek the kingdom, be part of it, and continue with my life. But it went on and on and on. After seven years, I was like, Lord, I don't know if I can do this. I remember I'd walk to the library. I was hungry. I was tired. I was praying within myself, Lord, when will I be part of your people? When will I be part of the tree that I may hear your word, understand your word? Be part of the festivals. Somebody had left a large green book on the table where I sat. So I put it to myself. It was an encyclopedia of different religions in the United States. I was kind of excited. I was like, well, there are many Jewish people in America. Maybe I'll find some who believe. So I went through the Jewish, sec uh, Jewish uh, section. Pardon me. There was nothing. Went to the Christian section and I stumbled upon Jews for Jesus. I almost fell off my, ch my seat, my chair. I wrote to them, I said, listen, I've been reading the Bible and I'm being, you know, pointed or drawn to Jewish believers. How can I be a part of you? So they wrote back to me, they said, we don't have any presence in Africa, but we're more than happy to send you a newsletter. 
But since you live outside of the United States and Canada, you have to pay $6 for the postage. It took me three months to raise that much. And I sent it to San Francisco. I remember receiving my second newsletter, February 1997. And there was this article about a Jewish woman who was having fellowship with other Jewish believers using the internet. That was the first time I heard of the internet. I was like, what is it? How does it look like? So I set out to look for it. I found it at the University of Zambia. At that time, there were 5,000 students. There were only five computers in the library. I went, I told the guy who was in charge. I was like, listen, I'm doing this research. I have information that there are, there are still people who worship the Lord the way he was worshipped in the first century. They keep Shabbat, they keep the festivals, and I'd like to know more about them. So he said, you know what, I'll let you, but you have to pay 50 cents. I have to go and work hard, sometimes beg on the street. Came back, found somebody who knew how to use a computer, and split the time. That's how I found the Messianic Jewish Alliance of America. And at that time, Rabbi Judah Hangerman was uh, the president of the IMS, IAMS. And I wrote to them, I said, look, I've been reading my, my Bible, it's pointing me to you guys. And they wrote back, they said, you know, we don't know what to, we don't usually do this, but we feel like we need to reach out to you. So they discipled me and invited me to come over to the United States. 2000, the summer, I came over. I met Jew and Gentile, one new man, the Messianic movement. Amen. I sat there at the Messiah conference and I was just crying. I was home. This is an end time prophetic movement. It's not about how we feel, it's about what the Lord says. The enemy hates us. But we need to stand. Because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. We have a mission. And that mission involves lives of our people. The Lord is appearing in many ways around the world. We need to pray for more faith and awareness about our God. He tells us again and again, you did not choose me, but I chose you. We are here because of him. We love him because he first loved us. All we need to do is to yield ourselves, that he may work through us. He may do what he wants through each one of us. We must understand who our God is. We are not here to invent something new. We are here to follow him. Amen. We are here to understand that we exist for him. Amen. We need to be in agreement with his will. Our God is working. Yes, the enemy is fighting. The enemy may try to discourage us. I believe this is a time for each one of us to be like David. To encourage ourselves. Some of you remember the story of King David. Before he became king, he had just come back and he found that all oh, his camp, together with his two wives and everyone else, had been taken captive by the Amalekites. His men were trying to stone him. But there's one thing that he did he encouraged himself in the Lord. I believe we are living during that time. When each one of us, we need to draw courage from Yeshua. To encourage ourselves, because the battle is the Lord. You look out in the world, it looks impossible right now. But one day, all Israel shall be saved. One day, every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess. Our God is a great God. Our God is a living God. And now that we are here, we need to know who we are. 
We are called to be a light, to provoke our people to jealousy. We need to be, to be passionate and excited about what the Lord is doing. It's all about Him. We are a small ministry in Zambia, but we have seen the Lord do great things through us. We are taking care of hundreds of orphans, teaching them to read and write, and above all, we teach them about the God of Israel. They are embracing biblical values. And because of that, our school, in the school district where we are at, we have 37 schools. We came out second. And these are kids from the street. These are kids without a father and mother. But as they embrace the God of Israel, he's transforming their lives. We are reaching out to the Jewish community. This coming year, Jewish voice is coming to Zambia and we will reach out to the Lemba Jews. We've been reaching out to the traditional Jewish community. We are called to plant the seed. Many of us get discouraged because we don't see the fruit. That's not our job. Our job is to plant the seed. Our job is to shine the light. The Lord does the rest. We've been reaching out to the Muslims. They're coming in. Reaching out to the tribal people. Right now, we have a discussion with one of the kings in northwestern Zambia. He has over 200,000 people. This is a man who went to Israel and he came back. He says, I want to serve this great God. Are we ready for the nations? You have what the world is dying for. You have the truth of Yeshua. You are called for such a time as this. May your light shine. May you be strong for your God, for Yeshua, knowing that even if we may be few, with God we're in the majority. It's not about our abilities or the place where we live. It's all about Him. He's doing it. And our God is on time. I want to close by reading uh, first uh, Thessalonians 5 verse 24. The one calling you is faithful and he will do it. The one who has called you is a faithful God. There's nothing that happens without his permission. Nothing takes him by surprise. He does not need permission for his will to move forward. He is God. When you come from a culture like where I come from, where you have the gods of the trees, gods of the valleys, and you encounter the God of Israel, he's in a class of his own. He's sovereign. He's a faithful God. He's true. He's merciful. He's compassionate. And he's righteous. Nothing can stand in his way. He may be quiet. But he's not still. If we open our eyes, we'll be surprised that he's been so busy. He's just a prayer away from each one of us. He knows each one of you, each one of us by name. Let's just reach out to him and he'll reach out to us. Once again, I want to say thank you for inviting me. Your congregation here is an important congregation. Throughout the world, we know of you. May you continue to be a light to the community here, in your country and the rest of the world. And may the God of Israel bless you. Shabbat Shalom.